scholar. He'll point out that uh, in his writings on iltifat, which is the way of referring to the, the, the Quran's weird habit of moving back and forth between singular, plural, first person, third person, you can't often tell who's speaking and when it changes. It, it's very dizzying and confusing. And uh, he points out that at the time the Quran was written, there was no such thing as a plural of majesty in Arabic. Among other translations, some Muslims will say it's Allah speaking to the angels. Others say it's Allah referring to his signs. Uh, others say that it's a way of Allah showing that he transcends the categories of personality. Muhammad Assad gave that interpretation. I have a whole series of articles written on this, which you can read. It's a 50-page article, uh, five parts on answeringislam.org. Uh, under my name there. So if you go there, you can find the whole discussion of this. The point I'm making now is just, this isn't clear. What is this talking about? And it's going to get even worse. Oops. I wonder if I sent myself an old version of this. Anyways, here's a, uh, notice it moves from we to third, well, I, this is just a way of me indicating first person and third person. Uh, what is this all about? It says, we made the sign of the night dark and we made the sign of the day bright so that you might look for your Lord's bounty and that you might work out the number of years and do reckoning, and we have made everything clear in detail. So this we is speaking about your Lord. Whoever the author of, or whoever the speaker is supposed to be here refers to someone as your Lord, the person he's talking to. Now, you might say, well, a person can speak in the third person. Well, the way the Quran does this ends up being so odd that it's not just Christians. It's Muslims who look at this and say, we can't make heads or tails of, of half of this. Uh, look, for example, at this passage. This is uh, Surah 7. O Prophet, so somebody's being addressed. I don't know why this computer's doing that. O Prophet, remind mankind about the incident when your Lord, wait, who's talking? It's supposed to be Allah who's speaking throughout the Quran, but he's telling this prophet to remind people of the incident when your Lord brought into existence the offspring from the loins of Adam and his descendants and made them testify about themselves. Allah asked them, who's talking? Who's talking here? That's not overly clear. And it's even worse in other passages. I've just chosen the passages where Allah claims to be speaking clearly. Okay. So we have a number of problems. By the way, who is Allah speaking to? I've mentioned, you know, at least this last passage I mentioned, O Prophet. But who is that? Muslims will claim it's Muhammad. Where does the Quran tell us that? The name Muhammad is only mentioned four times in the Quran, and those passages don't tell us that the entire thing is from him. Right? Uh, only four times is he mentioned, which, by the way, uh, it's dwarfed by the number of times Jesus is mentioned in the Quran. Uh, Jesus is mentioned at least 25 times. In fact, Pharaoh's mentioned more than this Muhammad figure. But many times in the Quran, the word Muhammad doesn't even appear to clearly be a proper name and looks more like a title. It means praised one. Many scholars have argued that this writing that it became the Quran was originally a Christian liturgical source that somebody took over and sort of adapted to their own ends, to, to cater to the ends of their uh, you know, attempt to make a religion and, and, and get dominance over Arabs and so forth. In any case, the, the fact is, we don't know who this person is that's being addressed in these places half the time. Say, the hallowed spirit sent it down from thy Lord, thy, who's thy? Who is thy in this statement? Uh, and it says, it, uh, people will say it's only a mortal who teaches him. Who's him? It doesn't tell us that. Now, Muslims can say, well, we know this from our sources. We have hadith narrations, traditions, going back to Muhammad and his companions. But notice what they have to do to say that. They have to go outside the book. The book that claims to be clear in itself, exhaustively detailed, explaining everything. Again, I'm only scratching the surface of this sort of thing in the Quran. It's, it's just a nightmare. Every, all over the place, this book is a confusing book. But that doesn't even get to the heart of the matter. This is what I call the mother of all problems. Now, I have to set it up here a little bit. Uh, enter the Christians of Najran. Uh, in the life of um, uh, Muhammad, written by Ibn Yitzhak, it's the er earliest extant biography of Muhammad, and actually we only have it in a recent. Uh, it's late, but it's the best Muslims have when it comes to a biography of Muhammad. And according to uh, this biography, a delegation of Christians came to Muhammad from Nadran, which is uh, uh, in Arabia uh, to the south. And uh, 
prior to this, so Muhammad allegedly became a prophet in 610, AD 610, and he had been prophesying, again, these are their words, I don't think he was a prophet, he didn't prophesy, but all the way up until 632, he was claiming that the Quran was a clear book. Okay? He died only a few months after this delegation of Christians came to him. Now, Muhammad's interactions with Christians was actually very negligible. There wasn't a lot of interaction with Christians prior to this point. He had an, a couple of people that he knew. His cousin, Raqqa, uh, early on was a Christian, but there weren't Jewish or there weren't Christian groups in Mecca and Medina. There were individuals that were occasionally around, but not some somebody from whom he could get a lot of information. Really, this delegation was the one when Muhammad had the most sustained contact with informed <laughs> Christians. So you'll see why this is significant in a moment. Uh, I know you can't read this either, um, but this is the section of the, the biography of Muhammad. And it says, a deputation from the Christians of Nadran came to the apostle, meaning they came to Muhammad. Uh, here it is, I blow it up a little bit. Um, and then skipping, skipping along, it just, after that, it has a bunch of names and it tells you who these people were and, and what their position was in the context of Najran. Uh, but this other part here says they were Christians according to the Byzantine rite, though they differed among themselves in some point. So that just refers to their litur liturgical approach and so forth. Byzantine rite Christians had a particular, uh, liturgy and so forth, uh, there's more to that, but they were Christians, according to the Byzantine rite, though they differed among themselves in some points, saying he is God, they're talking about Jesus, and he is the Son of God, and he is the third person of the Trinity, which is the doctrine of Christianity. They argue that he is God because he used to raise the dead and heal the sick and declare the unseen and make clay birds and then breathe into them so that they flew away. That last part isn't from the Bible, it's from an apocryphal source, but this, uh, you notice even in the account of what Christians believed, it's obvious that there's a little bit of confusion, not on the part of the Christians per se, but the Muslims who are recounting what they understood from the Christians. Because I hear this all the time. I'll talk to Muslims and others, and then when I hear them repeat back what I've said, I think, that's not what I said at all. That doesn't even come close to what I said. Uh, but you'll see another more glaring example here in just a moment. But it goes on, it says, they argue that he's the son of God and that they say he had no known father and he spoke in the cradle. Again, that's an apocryphal account. And this is something that no child of Adam has ever done. They argue that he is the third of three and that God says, we have done, we have commanded. See that? The God is the third of three. Now, what's possibly going on here is that these Christians of Nadran are pointing out to Muhammad things that are found in his revelation. They're saying, look, you're claiming to be a prophet and here your own book has Jesus raising the dead, uh, bringing clay birds to life. He's called, uh, it says he has no father, no earthly father. So who is his father? It may just be that they're pointing out, this is what your revelations say. Uh, but notice here, because this is quite obviously stuff from the Quran. They argue that he's the third of three and that God says we have done, we have commanded, right? Let me blow that up. We have created and we have decreed. And they say... If he were one, he would have said, I have done, I have created, and so on. But he is he and Jesus and Mary. So there's an obvious misrepresentation of what the Christians were telling them. You know, the Byzantine right Christians believe in the doctrine of the Trinity. Whatever else you might say about their views, they didn't deny that, and they didn't put Mary in the place of the Spirit. Well, uh, so this is the account. We're told these Christians came, and they're challenging Muhammad. Now, often, Muhammad had, would have a quick answer to people. He would fire back with this or that thing. And, uh, but often, you could tell when Muhammad was stumped because sometimes he would get red in the face. You, you read the uh, Hadith material, it'll talk about Muhammad getting red in the face. Uh, other times, it'll talk about Muhammad uh, uh, just coming up with some odd answer and people just sort of buying it and uh, sort of adding a bit of a threat, if you will, to it. Uh, but in this case, it's very interesting. When the Christians in the drawn are asking these questions, and I could read more of this, but I'm going to skip it for the sake of time. Uh, but when the Christians in the drawn put these questions to Muhammad, we're told that Muhammad was silent. 
They ask Muhammad all these questions. Who's his father? How did he do these things? Why does Allah speak in the plural in the Quran? By the way, the Christians of Madran spoke Arabic, right? They're Arabic Christians. Why didn't they say, oh, obviously, it's plural of majesty, right? Don't they know their own language? They know their own language. They didn't for a moment think it was a plural of majesty. There was no such thing. But what do Muslims tell you today? Well, what would we expect Muhammad to say in response to this? Well, well first of all, what we're told in the Sirah of Ibn Yitzhak, what we're told is that Muhammad, instead of replying, got silent. He went dead cold silent. And it wasn't until later, the next day, that he came back with a response to the Christians of Nadran. Here's where it's about to get good. This is Ibn Kathir's tafsir on the Quran. This is uh, his section on chapter 3, which is Surah Al-Imran. Uh, and it says, Surah Al-Imran, which is Surah 3, was revealed in Al-Medina, meaning this is after Muhammad had moved from Mecca to Medina, and as evident by the fact that the first 83 the ayat verses in it relate to the delegation from Nadran that arrived in al Medina on the ninth year of Hijra, 632. Right? So the first 80 verses of Surah 3 were revealed as a response to these Christians. So what, what were the questions? The questions were, you know, what do you say about Jesus? How did he do these things? Who was his father? Why does Allah speak in the plural? on all of this, until he gets this alleged revelation and comes back with it. The first 80 verses of Surah 3. Well, you could search the first uh, 80 verses of Surah 3. By the way, this is Sayyidi's uh, book on the occasions. Or uh, There's a whole science called the reasons and meaning the reasons why a certain Surah or chapter was revealed. And that, this is how we know that Surah 3 was supposedly revealed as a response to the Najrani Christians. So uh, Sayyudi uh, tells us the same thing. Uh, and he quotes numerous authorities, by the way, uh, that even precede him. So uh, Ibn Kathir, the tafsir I just read, Al-Sayyuti, uh, these other authorities that Sayyudi is quoting, they're all saying these, were, these verses were revealed as a response to the Najrani Christians. So what is it that Surah 3 reveals to us? Well, there are a few things that look like they might be responses to the questions that the Najrani Christians ask, but there are certain things that get no answer from Surah 3 apart from Surah verse 7. Here's what Surah 3 verse 7 says. Now I want you to notice this. Remember, wait, before I read that to you, I know you were all excited, weren't you? Before I read that to you, remember, Muhammad has been saying for 22 years that his book is clear. It clarifies everything. It's exhaustively detailed. It explains everything. Now, in the final months of his life, these Christians come and the gig is up. Muhammad has a falling out with himself. Look what Surah 3 7 says. He it is who hath revealed unto thee that Muhammad there is in parentheses. It's not really there in the Arabic. So it's again, we don't know who he's talking to, right? He it is who hath revealed unto thee the scripture wherein are clear revelations. They are the substance of the book, and others which are unclear. But those in whose hearts is doubt pursue, forsooth that which is unclear, seeking to cause dissension by seeking to explain it. None knoweth its explanation save Allah. And those who are of sound instruction say, we believe therein. The whole is from our Lord, but only men of understanding really heed. So here, suddenly we're told the Quran is not, as a whole, a clear book. It is a mixture of clear and unclear. That is not what Muhammad had been saying up to this point. Only now is Muhammad suddenly saying that. But now think about it. This is in response to questions like, why does Allah speak in the plural? Muslims today confidently say, oh, it's the plural of majesty. One, that didn't exist. But two, it's not the answer their prophet gave. This is the answer their prophet gave. Oh, there's some things that are unclear in the book. Uh, some things you just can't understand. Only Allah knows what they mean. Right? Oh, but it gets a good bit worse. How do we know what verses are clear and what verses are unclear? Um, notice that it says, those in whose heart is doubt pursue for soot that which is unclear, seeking dissension by seeking to explain it. So if you're seeking to explain the verses that are unclear, then you have uh, a heart that has doubt in it. In fact, really what it says is 
a, it tells us that you have a diseased heart. So you really need to know which verses are unclear, right? Otherwise, I mean, how do you know that you're not trying to understand a verse that's unclear? And if you're trying to understand a verse that's unclear, then you've got a diseased heart according to this. And you're striving in vain to understand it because only Allah knows its meaning. So does Allah ever tell us in the Quran which verses are clear and which verses are unclear? We're about to find out this verse is not very clear, by the way. <laughs> it's going to get really, really bad. Uh, here is Ahmed von Denfer, not the best picture, best, best I could find. He wrote a book called Ulum al-Quran. It's the same sort of thing as the book that Yasser Qadi wrote. It's on the sciences of the Quran, how we got the Quran, what is its nature, how do we interpret it. In his book, he says the word mukhamat, that's the word translated clear, is derived from the root ukhima, which means to decide between two things. It's a verbal noun in the plural, meaning judgments, decisions, and in technical language refers to all clearly decided verses of the Quran, mostly those concerning legal rulings, but also to other clear definitions such as between truth and falsehood, etc. This is what is meant by general mukhamat. Then it defines mutashabihat. In technical language, it refers to those verses of the Quran, the meanings of which are not clear or not completely agreed upon. Uh, now go back to this and notice it says at the end, none knoweth its explanation save Allah. So there are clear verses, there are unclear verses. The, it literally means clear and unclear because some Muslims will play a game here. Some will say that it's clear and allegorical. The word's not allegorical, it's unclear. There's an intentional contrast here and only Allah knows the meaning of these verses. And those who try to explain the unclear verses have diseased hearts. Right? They're seeking to cause decision. Uh, oh, here it is. Uh, well, it says in this translation, those in whose heart is doubt pursue forsooth that which is unclear, seeking dissension. Uh, others say diseased heart. Uh, here again is von Demfer. He tells you what mukhama, clear, means. Something of which knowledge was desired, something with only one dimension, something sufficient in meaning, requiring no further explanation. Mutashabihat, unclear, means something known to Allah only something with more than one dimension, something requiring further explanation. So that's the basic meaning of these things. Um, I don't think I, well, this thing's going a little weird. Uh, here is, I believe this is from, yeah, I'm not doing that weird stuff that's happening. <laughs> The computer's, for some reason, acting weird with my slides. Uh, um, okay, so actually, let me go back here real quick to this uh, passage. Notice it says, uh, they are the substance of the book, the clear revelations. Okay? That phrase in Arabic is actually um al-kitab, which means the mother of the book. So the clear verses are called the mother of the book. Now, what does that expression mean? Well, I mean, a mother, you can think, think through it, it uh, I mean, there's possibilities, but one, th one the idea is that mothers are the ones who give birth to children. Offspring come from them. So it, uh, it would seem to suggest that these clear verses, in some sense, are the mothers of these unclear verses, or at least of the book. The book itself is a product of these clear verses, or these are, these are the root of the rest of the book. But there's actually a number of candidates in Islamic history for what the mother of the book is. This is from, I believe, Yusuf Ali. Hold on, let me make sure here. Yeah, this is Yusuf Ali's commentary on the Quran. He says, uh, broadly speaking, it may be divided into two portions, not giving separately, but intermingled. That is the nucleus or foundation of the book, literally the mother of the book, and two, the part which is not well of well-established meaning. So there's, there's two parts to the book, clear and unclear. The clear stuff is the mother of the book. So what does that refer to? Uh, uh, and, and by the way, at the end there, he says the final meaning is known only to Allah of the unclear stuff. Um, here's a statement I got from Spencer. I'm just throwing this in here because it's new and I want people to go out and get uh, Spencer's critical Quran. But he says the assertion that no one knows its interpretation except Allah is striking. Why would Allah include material in his clear revelation of guidance to human beings that only he knows the meaning of? What sense does that make, right? Why reveal it if you can't understand it, if it's unintelligible? There's no clear answer to that, but absolute acceptance of the unclear along with the clear is enjoined upon the believers. This has helped to engender in Islamic culture a certain tendency 
to avoid questioning the Quran or pondering its injunctions critically. So Spencer asks a great question. Why would Allah even include this? What's the point? You know, it's one thing to say that some things are harder to understand, and you've got to work at them, that's fine. But to say that certain things are unclear and, and so unclear that you can't understand them, only Allah knows their meaning, what's the point of that? And, and how do you then navigate this book if it's telling you that some things are unclear in it, and if you try to understand their meanings, it's because you've got a diseased heart, and, and, and the book doesn't even tell you which, books, which verses are off limits. Wouldn't you be terrified to read this thing? In fact, isn't that the case with Muslims? If you've uh, interacted with Muslims, you know they often defer to their scholars. Oh, the scholars say this, the scholars say that. Well, the scholars say a bunch of stuff. You know why? Because the Quran's not a clear book. So they're all over the place. But they're afraid, the average Muslim's afraid to interpret the book. They have to defer to their scholar. Well, here's something, here's one thing that the mother of the book could refer to. Surah Al-Fatiha. Surah Al-Fatiha means Surah 1. That's the first chapter of the Quran, the opener. Uh, here's, look at, this is what Surah 15, 86 through 87 says. Notice this. It says, surely your Lord is the master creator, all-knowing. We have certainly granted you the seven oft-repeated verses and the great Quran. Now, Surah Al-Fatiha has seven verses in it. It's recited often by Muslims. You check the commentators, they'll all tell you this refers to Surah Al-Fatiha. Well, here's uh, uh, Ibn Kathir's tafsir on Surah Al-Fatiha. So I just read Surah 15. Here is uh, Ibn Kathir's tafsir, his commentary on uh, Surah 1. He says, this Surah is called Al-Fatiha, that is the opener of the book, the Surah with which prayers are begun. It is also called Um Al-Kitab, the mother of the book, according to the majority of scholars. Now, in case you're not catching what this would entail, if this is what mother of the book means, let me spell it out for you. Muhammad had been saying for 22 years that his book is clear. It explains everything, the book, the verses, it's all clear. A couple of, you know, a little delegation of Christians comes up and Muhammad now suddenly says it's not clear, but the clear verses are the mother of the book. Surah Al-Fatiha? If that refers to Surah Al-Fatiha, guess how many verses of this book that has 114 chapters, some of which are quite long, you know, the book ends up being this thick, seven verses of that book are clear on this interpretation. But what if it doesn't mean that? Now you're in even, I mean, it, it just gets even worse because now the verse that's supposed to be telling you how to approach the book, some things are clear, Clear, some things are unclear, ends up being unclear. But there are other candidates for what it means to refer to the mother of the book. Um, he goes on calling, telling us why it's called Surah, uh, or why it's called Um al Kitab. I wasn't sure if I included Al Kurtubi in here, but uh, here's Al Kurtubi. He says uh, uh, in his commentary on Surah al Fatiha, a termity related from Ubay bin Kab that the Messenger of Allah said, Allah has not revealed anything like the mother of the book, either in the Torah or the Gospel. Uh, it is the seven oft, or the seven matani, oft repeated. It is divided between me and my slave, and it goes on. So here's another Islamic authority, going back to Muhammad. Even Abbas, the cousin of Muhammad, is saying this is what it refers to, or this is what the mother of the book is. So the, the, the grand Quran, that for 22 years is a, nothing but a clear book, suddenly is reduced to seven verses that are clear. And by the way, those verses aren't all that clear either. Uh, if I wanted, if I had time, I'd go through them. They're, they're not all that clear. Uh, I mean, the problems with this just continue to multiply. But here's another possibility. It, this is Surah 1339. It says, Allah removes from memory what he thinks proper and keeps protected or intact in memory what he thinks proper. And with him is the ultimate source of Al-Kitab. Literally, with him is the mother of of the book. So the mother of the book is something that is with him. And uh, here's another reference to this in Surah 43.4, preserved in the divine tablet securely with us. It is majestic and full of wisdom. So Muslims think that the Quran is ultimately an eternal book. And we do see some correlation between this phrase, mother of the book, and this preserved tablet that exists. It's pre-temporal, exists outside of creation or at least precedes creation.
If this is what the mother of the Quran is referring to, then only part of the Quran actually comes from that preserved tablet. The whole book is not eternal. Because remember, it's the, the, the clear verses that are the mother of the book. If the mother of the book refers to this preserved tablet, well, then only that part of it is part of this pre-creation book. Uh, what's even worse, though, is that this preserved tablet is literally said to have been created in various Islamic sources. If you look towards the b uh, bottom of this, uh, it says, um, then he said, do you know what the mother of the book is? I said, Allah and his messenger know better. He said, it is a book that Allah wrote before he created the heavens. So this is something Allah wrote before he created the heavens. That doesn't sound eternal. It's old, but it's not eternal. But it's orthodox Islamic theology that the Quran is Allah's speech, his literal speech, must be eternal. So if the Quran is really uh, the, the, the clear verses of the mother of the book and it's rooted in this, well then the Quran, only part of it comes from this book and that book is not eternal. This just strikes at the heart of Islam. But it also strikes at the claim that this verse is clear. The verse is not clear. Now. I could keep going on with this, and I, I think I'm probably coming near to the end of my time constraints due to certain uh, less than nice sources, no, forces. <laughs> um, but let me, let me point this out. One of the things, oh, I guess I'm, I'm, giving, I'm being given the cue that I've got 10 more minutes. One of the things that we're told by most Muslim authorities is that the, the clear stuff relates to matters pertaining to Sharia. Now, the Quran doesn't say this, but I'm going to grant this to them for a moment. They'll say that it pertains to matters of Sharia. That's Islamic rulings or laws, you know, governing, uh, you know, like uh, what happens if you have a, if you've married a prepubescent girl and you divorce her, uh, how long do you have to wait before she can be married again? You might be thinking just the notion of that is repugnant, and you're right. But that's taught in the Quran, this, and so that's part of the Sharia. So that sort of stuff is clear. It's other stuff that isn't so clear, which would include stuff like what? What we means, you know? But look at how many times we is used in the Quran. It's hundreds of times. Now, my view, if you read my article on that, you'll see that I believe Muhammad overheard Jews, and uh, at least Jews, reciting the Old Testament where God does speak in the plural. As Christians, we have no difficulty understanding that. It's the triune God. Muhammad didn't believe in a triune God. So he picked up this language thinking, oh, this must be how God speaks or something. But then when he was pressed on it, well, what's it all mean? He was uh, suddenly without words. I don't know what it means. Well, and, and we see Muhammad doing that often. He often picked up things from Jews and Christians like a dog picks up fleas. I mean, he didn't know where these things came from. He didn't know what they meant. And uh, he was fine until somebody would ask him a question, and then suddenly he'd fall apart. Well, but it's not just the we passages. I was just using that for illustrative purposes. All throughout the Quran, you end up having statements that don't fall into Sharia, and you have to ask, what do these things mean? Well, if, if the clear verses refer to what is counted as Sharia law, well, there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that's just not clear. In fact, let me give you a verse. I'll end on this. Surah 4, 157. This is the one verse that makes explicit reference to the crucifixion of Jesus. It is for this reason that Muslims not only reject what Christians believe to be the significance of Christ's crucifixion, but even reject the event of the crucifixion. Right? From our perspective, the, as Christians, it, it's, we don't just have this belief that Jesus was crucified. Our belief as Christians is that he was crucified for our sins. Right? That's, that's the gospel, right? And he rose again for our justification. But a person could know the facts. They, they don't have to deny the facts. It wouldn't make them Christians, but they can affirm that Jesus died by crucifixion. But Muslims don't even go that far. Why? Because they think the Quran says that Jesus was not crucified. Surah 4, 157 says, They say in boast, we have killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, but they killed him not nor crucified him, but so it was made to appear to them. You know, and then it says, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're in doubt and so forth. They're, they're, they're subject to conjecture. Uh, they have no clear knowledge about this matter. Notice it makes reference to others being in the dark and not really knowing the truth. Would you know that that verse itself has been disputed by Muslims throughout history? This verse on, on the basis of which they reject one of the most certain facts of the first century? 
I mean, if you look, if you look at the scholarship on, maybe you don't know about this, the scholarship on Jesus, even unbelieving scholarship, they don't question whether Jesus was crucified. You've got these really weird fringe scholars that might call in question Jesus' existence, but they're just sort of laughed out of the guild, uh, the historical you know, area of study. But scholars that are familiar with the material all say, yeah, he died by crucifixion. We have no question about this. Well, here's Muslims rejecting that most certain fact on the grounds that the Quran says this, and the verse isn't clear. Let me give you an example of why it's not so clear. When it says, they say in boast, it's supposed to be talking about the Jews. They say in boast, we have killed Christ Jesus, uh, but they have neither killed him nor crucified him. Some Muslims take that to mean that because the Quran elsewhere says, when somebody's killed, like if a Muslim's killed in battle, don't say that the enemy did it, say that uh, Allah is the one who took them. It's, it's, it's in other words, not giving glory to the enemy, it's Allah who's ultimately in control. That's something the Quran says. So some Muslims have said, all this verse is saying is that the Jews did not have the power to kill Jesus. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember hearing, uh, here's a sentence, think about this sentence. If I say, I didn't say that you took my wallet, right? That might sound clear to you, but it's really not. What if I say, I didn't say that you took my wallet, you know, but he did, you know. Or what if I say, I didn't say you took my wallet, I, you know, he did. Or I didn't say you took my wallet, you know, you borrowed it. You know, I mean, there, there's all these different ways you could understand that. I didn't say you took my wallet, you just took the money in my wallet, you know. The, what some people think is the emphasis is placed on the Jews here, that the Jews didn't do it. Rather, it was the Romans or it was Allah. Uh, but there's also debate among Muslims what it means to say that it was made to appear to them like he was crucified. The Jews certainly thought Jesus was crucified, didn't they? They thought he was crucified, so who made it appear to them? Who made it unclear, by the way? <laughs> made it appear as if Jesus was crucified. When, who's in the business of making things look unclear? Well, we know Allah is. And, some Muslims have said that that's what was happening. Allah made somebody else look like Jesus. Some say it was Judas because of his treachery. Others would say it was one of the noble disciples offering to die for Jesus. I mean, there's all these different interpretation among Muslims. There's a whole book. There's books, actually. Not just one, but there's books written on this topic. I could give you a reference afterwards. Uh, but it, it's not clear. And you check the commentators, they'll tell you it's not clear. And yet the verse is charging other people with being in doubt. By the way, the verse is not even historically accurate. What sense does it make to say, they, the Jews, said and boast, we have killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary. We have killed Christ Jesus. Did the Jews think Jesus was the Christ? Why would any Jew say that? The Jews rejected Jesus because they didn't think he was the Christ, right? The Quran has the Jews saying, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, in boast. Why would they boast about that? That was their whole hope. They, they, they rejected Jesus once they figured out he wasn't really what they thought was supposed to be true of the Messiah. And so here's a verse just riddled with ambiguity, and that by the admission of Muslims. And it's not even one of, I mean, so, I mean, it's not Sharia. It's not a verse about Sharia, law. It's a verse about something central to the Christian faith, something about Jesus. So what is clear in this book? I don't know, honestly. According to at least a number of commentators, Surah Al-Fatiha is clear, first seven verses of the Quran. I don't think Surah Al-Fatiha is clear. By the way, Muslims aren't even agreed on how to properly punctuate Surah 3-7. Some Muslims will say when it says no one knows their meanings except for Allah, there should be a comma there, and then it should say, and those who are rooted in knowledge. You know, so in other words, Allah knows the meanings, and certain special scholars know the meanings. That's a later interpretation. In any case, though, it's, it's only one of a number of interpretations. How just utterly destructive this is. This book is clear, it's clear, it's clear, it's clear. Year one, year two, year three, year four, year five, it's still clear. Year six, it's clear. Year seven, it's clear. Year 22, it's clear. Hi, Christians from Nadron. Oh, well, you see, the answer to that is this book's not clear, right? But there are at least seven verses that are clear, or maybe some stuff on Sharia. Well, maybe this verse isn't that clear. You know, what's the mother of the book? We don't know what the mother of the book. I mean, it's just, and I could go on and on with this. It's, it's hopelessly bad. And I, didn't, I wouldn't even need this verse to know that the Quran's an unclear book. I mean, again, I gave you an example of Surah 4, 157. Uh, there's another passage, Surah 17. Well, actually, one of my favorites, uh, I believe it's 
096 where it says, who are in rapt arise and warn. You might think, what does that mean? Uh, you, you know, oh, actually, I didn't tell you about one of my, uh, remember that verse I was reading earlier where it says, remind them, Surah 7, remind them how uh, Allah brought out of, uh, Adam's descendants from, out of, you know, from Adam. Uh, maybe you heard that a certain way. Maybe you heard that as saying Allah created Adam and then his descendants were born or something like that. If you check the commentators, that's not at all what the verse is talking about. Here's what it's really talking about. It means that Allah created Adam and then Allah stroked Adam's back with his hand and brought out of Adam's back his descendants. So he, he, he extracted the seed out of Adam. By the way, for those of you who know the Quran, why would Allah stroke Adam's back in order to get the seed out? Because according to the brilliant author of the Quran, semen proceeds from between the backbone and the ribs, right? So here's Allah extracting the, the seed of Adam from him before we were ever born. And he caused everybody, all of you stood before Allah at the beginning of time and he said, I'm the Lord, so that when everybody was born into the world, they would all know that Allah is the true God and nobody would ever have any excuse. That's the Islamic view of saying that everybody knows Allah and is born into the world as a Muslim. That's what Surah 7 is talking about. Did any of you, were any of you thinking that when I read it? Perfect example that this is not a clear book. None of you thought that Allah gave the first back rub in history and extracted from Adam his semen and then put them all back in there, right, so that they could eventually be born. Like none of you were thinking that. And that happens over and over again in the Quran. Read the Quran. What's this saying? Read the commentary. <laughs> Something entirely different. This is not a clear book. And so I hope this has been helpful to you. I hope that you'll use this in your discussions with Muslims. Muslims make boasts about their religion that are far from true. I'd love to talk about, in fact, I'm going to talk about Allah tomorrow. They pretend that their doctrine of God is clear in contrast to your confused belief in the Trinity. Oh, let me assure you, their doctrine of God is not clear, not any more, more clear than their book is. Neither are clear. This book is an ambiguous book, and it's one of many reasons why people ought to reject it. Hi, um, I think I'm on live. Sorry, how are you, sister? Good. <laughs> I didn't know, so I was just making sure. I'll wait. All right. Thank you, Reverend Anthony Rogers, for that talk. Uh, this time, we're going to hear from Sister Nada. And uh, she's going to share her testimony. But before she does, um, we have over 500 people watching online. And we're having a little bit of difficulty with the video. So if you have any kind of device that is logged on to the, uh, to the Internet here, if you could disconnect, we would greatly appreciate that. Uh, but at this time, we want to welcome Sister Nada to share her testimony. And thank you so much for uh, being with us tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. And for all of those who are in attendance and watching online, um, just sincerely thank you for having a heart to minister to Muslims um, and to spread the good news of our Lord Jesus. Uh, I was asked to share my testimony and um, Oh, it's just, we serve an amazing God and the things that he has done um, using other people who, similar to you, have a heart for Muslims um, is just amazing. So I'll start with my background. My parents were both born in Palestine in the West Bank, um, a small village called Deir Dibwan. And after they got married, they came to the States. And they're... Um, they're both devout Muslims. My dad um, would read the Quran 
all day, really, um, whenever he could pray five times a day. My mom wore the headscarf and um, they just very much were uh, ingrained in the religion and tried to raise their kids that way. They have um, eight daughters, uh, no sons. All they wanted was one boy. And so they kept trying. And after eight girls, uh, they learned that that wasn't in the plans for them. I'm the youngest of those eight daughters. And um, my parents married off uh, five of my sisters through arranged marriage, very traditional Islamic marriages um, where my sisters really didn't even meet the men that they were marrying. One of my sisters was only 14 years old when my parents married her off. And this is pretty consistent with what their prophet did and um, really even younger. But anyway, um, my parents were uneducated and they the highest education they, they completed was middle school. And so those uh, out of those five sisters that had arranged marriages, uh, only um, one of those graduated even high school. And I'll get to the end of the story, but I'm you know talking to you today as a Christian, as um, an attorney, you know, coming from that background. So it's just <laughs> again, we serve a really good God. And. Um, let me see. So there's so much that God has done. Uh, so five of my sisters had arranged marriages. The sixth one uh, was engaged and um, she's very uh, stubborn and strong. And so she broke that off and um, really stood up to my parents and to their beliefs and um, told them that she was going to college. And naturally the seventh and myself, the eighth followed in her footsteps. And I've always felt that um, I always knew God existed, always, you know, never questioned, um, always felt that he was with me. You know, Islam is always like you're working. God is way up there and you're working so hard, you know, to get to where he is and to, um, you know, to get to heaven. Really, it's works based. And, um, you know, even as a little girl, as uh, young as five years old, I felt that God was with me. You know, that he was like my best friend, my imaginary friend. And of course, in a Muslim household, I didn't know that that was even a thing. I thought I was the only person in the world that had this relationship with God, that everywhere I went, that he was there, that he, um, you know, was just friends with me. I knew that he loved me. I knew that um, he wanted me to love others. You know, now as a Christian, I, you know, the, the scripture says that, um, love your neighbor as yourself. And that's the greatest commandment. And the law can be summed up in that. And it's um, just quite extraordinary that that God revealed that, you know, that the Holy Spirit was with me even then. But still, all I knew was Islam. And even growing up in the States, um, I had never heard the gospel, really. And everything that I heard about Christians came from my parents. And it was, you know, along the lines of Christians don't even know what they believe in. There's different churches on every street corner, different types of churches that don't agree with each other. Uh, my parents would love talking about the sexual abuse within the Catholic church. They they didn't distinguish between Catholics and Christians. They were all the same. And the immorality amongst the culture, you know, America is a Christian nation, but you look around and it doesn't, you know, that that's what Christians act like. So that's what I had grown up with. And so I never really thought that, you know, Jesus, there was anything to it. Um, and it wasn't until I was in high school um, and I was 17. I went to one of my friend's houses and her mom was what you would say a Jesus freak. Just, you know, hi, nice to meet you. Let me tell you about Jesus. He loves you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And that was the first person that I actually met that was uh, bold in their faith and, um, you know, cared to share with me about that. And I remember even in their house uh, all year round, they had multiple nativity scenes. So when I say Jesus freak, really, they were. So I thought she was crazy, of course, and just weird. Why can't she stop talking about Jesus? Um, but 
it's hard to explain. I just felt like a familiarity of spirit with her, you know, that she knew the same God I knew because when she would talk about her God, it was love and it was grace. And she had such a personal relationship with him and she would offer to pray with me. And I remember, you know, one instance in particular, I was in her doorway, I was getting ready to go home and she said, can I pray with you? And I, you know, I said, yes, people usually don't say no when you say, can I pray for you or, you know, pray with you. And that same feeling I had of God's presence growing up, I felt, but even like really strong. And it just brought me to tears. Like I wasn't sad. It's just, you know, the Holy Spirit. Now I know looking back, I, um, I just was crying like this. There's, there was something powerful about it. Um. But being 17 and, you know, I was almost 18 go, going away to college um, to I was moving away finally from my parents and just breaking free from, you know, everything really and trying to find my myself. I had also unfortunately um, gone through childhood sexual abuse by um, another Middle Eastern man that my parents took under their wing and would bring in their house. And um, so even though I had heard the gospel and I knew that there was something powerful about it, I just um, continued to live my own life. And um, I didn't really follow through with it at all. I just um, I just thought I want to get my college degree, buy a house, you know, get a career and live differently than what my parents lived. And so um, when I was in college, though, I still felt like I wanted to know what the true religion was, you know, who really was God. Um, so I took a religions of the world class. And of course, you know, in a California public college, didn't learn anything good there. But um, I ended up working for a Christian man who, again, was bold enough to share with me. And he saw that I um, was seeking or was open and really would, um, talk to me. He knew a lot about Islam and was able to uh, compare and con contrast Christianity and Islam for me. And, you know, just really answer a lot of questions. And again, bold enough to um, invite me to his church. He told me to go with my roommates and try out his church. And so I did. And um, I heard the gospel, you know, I had the pastor just preached an amazing sermon. And I, it was one of those things where I thought, wow, the pastor knew I was there, you know, that my boss had told him and knew my circumstances. And he preached his whole sermon around me. <laughs> and I come to learn that, you know, a lot of people feel that way. But I had I didn't know any better. So I just thought, you know, wow, like he dedicated this whole sermon to me. Um, so around that time, I would say I was about 20. So I first heard the gospel when I was 17. Um, around age 20 is when I um, really intellectually started believing that, yes, Christianity is the the true religion. And I remember at church on an Easter Sunday, the pastor did, um, you know, a call to faith, raise your hand, repeat this prayer. So I did that. And they gave me um, a bag with a Bible and a coupon for a donut in it. And I walked on my merry way. Um, and I didn't ever, well, around that time, didn't read the Bible, didn't know any, really anything. I just knew that Jesus was the true God and um, I had narrowed it down. You know, I can check that off my list. <laughs> and um, it wasn't, it took a long time. And I'm sure some of you who've been ministering to Muslims know it's uh, a work of patience and perseverance. It's um not for those seeking instant gratification. And um, so thankfully, though, God had brought people in my life at the right time um, and people who were bold and who were knowledgeable. And so um, I, one of my friends in college, her family's uh, Christian, and they actually came from Iran and had a Muslim background. And so um, I really, uh, their daughter and I were both going through a hard time. And we just read the Bible and we fasted and I understood truly, you know, what it meant to walk with the Lord and um, yeah, just to have that relationship with him. 
And even though I didn't uh, necessarily believe what my parents believed in, and I always felt that God was with me and that that was different than what my parents believed, Islam was still like a part of me. Uh, culturally, it was, you know, my family to me is everything. Um, that's how we're raised. You know, you're you're just, you respect your parents, you respect what they believe, you honor them. Um, and so it was really difficult, even though I had, you know, intellectually checked the boxes, you know, did the profession of faith. I didn't really know how to even tell my parents this would break their, their heart. And so um, I would pray about it. And uh, finally, it took me a while, but finally, uh, my mom actually asked me, I was wearing just like normal beaded earrings. And my mom said, are those Christian earrings? And I knew because I had been praying on my way to my parents' house, you know, as I did often for God to um, present a way for me to tell them without, you know, dishonoring them or disrespecting them. Um, so when she asked me that, I said, no, but if they were, I would wear them anyway. And she looked at me and she said, are you telling me that you're a Christian? And I said, yes. And she called my dad into the room and they sat and talked to me about how I was brainwashed and, um, you know, taken advantage of by the church that I was going to, that they just, you know, they, again, they worship three gods and all of these, um, all of these things that, is, that Muslims who don't know any better think. And so at this point, um, I had studied and was knowledgeable, particularly the stumbling blocks for me in coming to faith were forgiveness, just the idea that um, you can be forgiven for not only your past sins and your present sins, but your future sins. It seemed unjust to me. Uh, so when I first heard the gospel at 17, that's, I just thought, you know, that that's not a God of justice. You know, you could just keep doing what you want essentially. And um, so that took me a while to understand and still even till this day, God's grace and forgiveness really is, I think as Christians, we, you know, it becomes like common to us, but um, it's quite extraordinary and um, illogical. And it doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's grace and it's God's goodness and his love for us. But um, I just wanted to share that in that, um, you know, things that seem commonplace to us because that's what we're used to or we know they're um, shocking. I would still say till this day, the grace of God towards me is shocking and um, another thing that I stumbled with was the Trinity, because yes, again, weird and illogical uh, at first, at first blush, uh, three gods in one, you know, which is it? And then you hear the analogies and everything else. But um, it took me uh, watching many of uh, the late Nabil Qureshi's videos and uh, people like him who knew how to explain it and what it was. Sorry. I'm an emotional basket case, <laughs> but um, I, when I told my parents and they sat me in the kitchen and were confronting me with all of these things, I was at a point where I was really able to explain it to them and explain to them that, you know, no mom and dad, it's, they, we don't worship three gods. That's wrong. It's, it's one God. And, um, you know, to explain about, although there's different churches on every street corner, the, the message of the gospel is essentially the same. Um, and also, you know, kind of point out some of the differences and disagreements within Islam, because the first thing that they said was, you know, it's black and white. And that's, you, many of you guys already know, and have even heard before me that that's really not the case. But my parents, you know, went, it went in one ear and out the other. And so they told me that day, they said, if you choose to be Christian, you're choosing that over us and um, you, you're you choosing not to be our daughter. And I was relatively a new Christian at this point. You know, um, I really had thought that becoming a Christian fits, solves all your problems and 
because in a way, I mean, in some sense it does, but it really doesn't. But I just thought everything was going to be great. And aren't most people in America Christian and, you know, still just had some of those um, wrong ideas in my mind. So I was pretty shocked. And um, I this was before I had read the whole Bible front to back. Um, but when they told me that and they, I told them that, no, I'm not um, I'm not choosing this over you. But if you don't want me as your daughter because of this, then that's your decision. So I really, you know, made it clear to them that I love them. They'll always be my parents. But if this is what they wanted, they wanted to disown me, then that was on them. And so I wasn't living with them at the time. I was living two hours away. So I got in my car and drove home and I was just devastated again. Like, why, why would this happen? You know, if God was on my side and I knew him and I wanted, you know, a relationship with him, why would I be losing my parents? And I remember sitting on my bed, having my Bible, crying, you know, and just like crying out to God. And then I had opened my Bible and it was, um, you know, first there was Matthew 10 about, you know, Jesus saying he didn't come to bring peace, but to set a mother at variance against her daughter. And if you don't want to pick up your cross and follow him and proclaim him among men, then he won't proclaim you in front of his father. And then also um, the verse about if you're persecuted, I think it's 2 Timothy uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, if you're persecuted for Christ's sake, then you should be happy and God's glory rests upon you. You know, don't be persecuted as a thief or anything else. But if it's just because of Jesus Christ and your belief in him, then, you know, there the glory of God rests on you. And so immediately I just felt, okay, I, I'm doing this right. This is okay. You know, and, um, God knew that this would happen, and um, just the fact that he had led me to those verses uh, was just quite calming, and my parents didn't talk to me for a while at all. I mean, my mom used to call me every day, but after a while, they came around, and um, at first, it started as, you know, we just don't talk about your faith and, um, you know, act like you're not a Christian. Uh, and then slowly they started seeing the change within me and the people that I was around, um, you know, just introducing them to some of my Christian friends and their parents. And they really got to see, um, you know, what Christianity looks like. And they saw firsthand the transformation in me and my attitude towards them, the way I live my life, my demeanor, just everything. And so they started actually asking for um, prayer requests and when something would happen. They would, you know, tell me to tell my um, Christian friends to pray. And one of my sisters even said, those Christians can get their prayer requests around the world in 20 minutes through email. So you tell them to pray. <laughs> and so it was um, just quite a change from when they, when they first started. And, um, you know, now I'm 35. I've been, um, a Christian for about 15 years. And my dad walked me down the aisle when um, I got married to my husband, who um, is Christian. We have two beautiful kids, a, a four-year-old girl and a one-year-old boy. And um, yeah, it's just God is good. I'm an attorney I represent a lot of ministries and churches. Uh, I work for a nonprofit, Advocates for Faith and Freedom. And especially like when COVID hit and churches were shut down in California, we took on a lot of those cases. And we represent, you know, everything from street preachers, the, the whole shebang. Um, <coughs> or excuse me. Just with the goal of using our legal career to protect the right to spread the gospel. And so in closing, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. I would say, you know, to all of you who have a heart to minister to Muslims, that um, just showing them love, being bold in that love, <coughs> and really showing grace and explaining grace in the gospel because that's a stark contrast to Islam and the workspace religion. 
So my voice is starting to give out, but thank you all for ministering to my people. And um, yeah, just hang in there. You never know how your prayers and your ministry, your words, um, what fruit it's going to bear in the future. But um, just have that faith in what is unseen, that the word of God doesn't come back void. So you might not see the fruit of that, of your ministry and your evangelism. You, in most cases, I would say, for years down the line, if ever. Uh, but continue to do, continue to be bold and to um, show that love. You know, it's like pe- someone who's thirsty, and uh, you know, I've, I can tell you that Muslims are thirsty. They're so thirsty for the love of God and the grace of God. And even when, you know, the Jesus freak was ministering to me at 17 and and my boss, I never showed that it was that I understood it or that it was getting to me or affecting me. You know, I still I stood my ground and um, just doubted. And (laughs) but God was still at work in that. And um, I can see looking back how, you know, just the boldness of those people really impacted who I am now and the mother that I am, the lawyer that I am, the wife that I am. Um, And I'm just so grateful for that. And I pray that you would continue to have a heart to minister to Muslims and also have the courage for that too. So with that, thank you and God bless. It was a little bit difficult for us to hear it here. I know uh, a lot of you guys couldn't, we, we were losing connection quite a bit, but I just want to let you know that you can go back on YouTube and listen to it again. Uh, it, evidently it was streaming on YouTube a lot better than it was here. So, but thank you so much, Sister Nada. Thank you for sharing with us and taking the time to be with us here tonight. All right, so we're going to take about two minutes and then we'll begin our panel discussion. And uh, we'll close out with that for tonight. Okay? Know that we're-
if you feel that someone else is better, you know, equipped to answer this, just let me know. We'll, uh, we'll go to Dr. Ed. <clears throat> All right, so just very simple, basic questions. Uh, number one, why is it important for Christians to learn about Islam? Dr. Del Coro. Well, I, I think it's very important that Christians learn um, not only in Islam, but other world religions, because you're going to eventually you're going to have to confront because they're going to come to you. They're bolder than Christians. Christians don't like to go out outside the gate, but a lot of non-Christian world religions, non-Christian cults, they like to go out of the gate. They come to your doors. You see them in, in parks. You see them all over the place. Islam is very aggressive. Christians have to know basic answers. They have to know basic answers. If they're going to communicate the gospel, they have to know basic answers, not only for Islam, but also for their own religion, first and foremost. So I think it's extraordinarily important for evangelistic purposes. Thank you. All right, secondly, um, it's been said that uh, Islam uses a, it uses Christian vocabulary, but they do not use a Christian dictionary. Um, Anthony, would you would you uh, maybe elaborate on some of those terms uh, that yeah. that may confuse Christians? Sometimes I'd say Muslims don't even uh, stick to the Quran. Oftentimes, I mean, David, a uh, friend of ours, David Wood, he often refers to Muslims interpreting their own book as the miracle of. Reinterpretation, <laughs> and that's where the Quran suddenly means something other. You know, the verse says, "Kill the idolaters." It doesn't mean kill the idolaters, according to Muslims. He calls that the miracle of reinterpretation. Uh, but there's all sorts of things. Any term that they use in common with Christians that has a distinctively Islamic meaning is one such word. So, just the word God. I'm going to talk tomorrow about the Christian doctrine of God and then the Islamic doctrine of God. We don't mean the same thing by God. And so sometimes Muslims will say things like, you know, we both believe in God, there's only one God, therefore we believe in the same God. And that's just fallacious, that's, that's equivocal. We don't mean the same thing. If I say, you know, moon, and you use the word moon, and I keep pointing at that desk, at some point somebody's gonna have to say, we don't mean the same thing, right? We're using the same term, we have very different reference. And, and similarly, when Muslims say that their God is a colossal deceiver, or at least their books do, we're not talking about the same God. When the Quran says that Jesus is not the son of the father, that's not the same God, it's not the God of Christianity. So there's nothing more fundamental as an example I can give than that, but that's pretty standard across the board of terms that we use and they use. Okay. Thank you, you answered questions three and four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I have a question for Laura. Uh, Laura, how significant would you say it is for Christian women to be uh, prepared, equipped, and ready to uh, witness to Muslim women? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that question because I think um, uh, a lot of people may not realize the tremendous separation that there is between the sexes in most mm -hmm. Muslim majority countries. And so um, when I go to places like um, Afghanistan or Egypt or Jordan, I have um, an open invitation into women's rooms to sit and, and eat with them and talk with them. But that is not an opportunity a man would have. In fact, he, he wouldn't in, in Afghanistan um, and, and in the situations I was in in Egypt, um, men wouldn't even see women. They, they, unless they were married to that woman or, you know, were uh, immediate family members. And so um, it's incredibly important for Christian women to be prepared and equipped and learn how to, to minister to Muslim women's, women because we're the only ones who are gonna get it done. We're the ones who can do it. We're the ones with the opportunity. So it's incredibly important. Thanks. All right, so back to Dr. Dalcour. Um, we often talk about barriers that, that Muslims have to the gospel, but what are some of the internal barriers that we have as a church that are, that are keeping us from, from witnessing to Muslims? Good question. It's interesting when, 
many times, and I'm sure a lot of you have had the same experience, why is it that the kids, the youth of the, of the whether it's Islam or the Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door or Mormons, why are they so bold in defending and affirming their faith? It's because they're taught. They're, they're, they're teaching constructs. Whereas in Christianity, we're given our youth uh, bands and, and other things. We're not training, same with the adults. T pastors today are not trainers of theology. They're cruise ship directors. They're carnival barkers. They're given everything but theology. So if you don't, under, if you don't have a set foundation of biblical theology, you're going to be very hesitant about talking to anyone except the people in your own church. You're not going to want to confront because someone might ask you a question. So you're going to be very, very sheepish. And I think that's one of the largest barriers, just a lack of having a set foundation. If you don't have a set foundation, you're not going to have any confidence. Whereas in other non-Christian groups, the kids are confident. The adults are confident because they've been trained. They know what to say. They know what not to say. So I think that's one of the, as I see it, one of the most enormous barriers with the Christian church by and large. Awesome, thank you. I'd like to give the rest of you an opportunity to chime in on that. Anything oh, sure, there? I was not even paying attention. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Typical. <laughs> uh, well, hewing off of that, one thing I'd say is there is a confidence that Muslims often have. It's a false confidence, a, a, you know, but one, one thing is, uh, and so I'll, I'll make an encouragement or an application of this in, in a second, but one thing that gives Muslims confidence is that the Quran and the Islamic sources, it comes along after Christianity. So that it's responding to at least what it thinks is Christianity. And this then gives Muslims the thought that they have revelation from their God specifically addressing our views. So they think that they're not just coming to us opposing with what they have, what we have, what they have actually addresses, speaks to what we have. And so Christians, I think, really need to learn and read their Bibles because the things that are given there, although directed to particular circumstances and things like that, it's there for our instruction. It's intended to provide examples of things that come along. So in other words, think for example of, uh, there, there are numerous false gods mentioned in the Old Testament. You have Baal. In fact, if you read the Islamic sources, there's good evidence to believe that the worship of Allah is originally the, the worship of Baal. And the, the chief deity of the Kaaba in Mecca was called Hubble. And that's Hu Baal. In Hebrew, Hu means he. Baal is the name for the deity. You have he is Baal. If you look at 1 Kings 18, the conflict between Elijah and the prophets of Baal, they keep crying out saying, he is Baal in Hebrew, who Baal, who Baal. So the point is we do have something in scripture to give us an example to, you know, we can look at this sort of thing. This is what the apostles are doing. Just the other day, I was thinking about the fact that there's something interesting that Paul does in Galatians when he's refuting the Judaizers who had corrupted the gospel and had said that it's not just through faith in Christ, it's also by faith plus works. Remember what the Judaizers taught. They taught that in addition to faith in Christ, something else was needed. In their case, they said, you have to engage in circumcision. Paul refers to it as the mutilating of the flesh. He's alluding to something, and he does this all throughout Galatians. He's alluding to the veil worshipers. What were they doing trying to appease their deity? They mutilated themselves. Yeah. Right, so Paul is likening the Judaizers as corruptors of the gospel to veil worshipers. Now, so my point here is just, yeah, the, the Bible doesn't make explicit reference to the false prophet Muhammad. He came along 600 years later, but we have examples of false prophets. Yeah. We just have to learn to draw the lines and it makes reference to false gods. So I, I think that that gives Muslims some confidence. Christians don't have it because they're not thinking through what they do have. You know, we're given a revelation application instead of necessarily one that makes the application already. You know what I'm saying? The, the Quran is already talking about Judaism and Christianity. The Bible is talking about just false religions. So we need to make these applications when new religions arise. That's good. And that, you know, that, I was just thinking that uh, 
brings up how differently Muslims learn about Christianity. You know, they learn, they learn about Christianity, although they, they have a, a, a false view of Christianity, but they learn about us by reading the Quran. Uh, and, you know, we, we don't learn about Islam by reading the Bible. I mean, it's kind of a, you know, you can, you can learn about Islam if you're interested in it. So uh, I think that's a huge difference too. But Laura, is there anything that you would add to, to what you've been said? I, I think there are a couple things. Um, we, at which both of the gentlemen alluded to, um, if not said explicitly, um, we need to know what we believe, what our Bible says. Um, uh, you know, I, I was reading uh, the latest Barna poll recently, and it showed that um, six percent of, of people who claim to be Christians uh, have <clears throat> some sort of kind of semblance of a Christian worldview, and it was more like you know, no more than 3% if you ask two or three questions um, about what the Bible teaches. And so I, I think we really need to know what we believe, what the Bible says, what God has revealed. And then um, what has given me tremendous confidence in engaging with Muslims has been learning a little bit about uh, about the problems with, with Islam. We, we live in the greatest uh, time uh, now to um, to confront Islam, there are all kinds of people doing really really great work discovering you know, the Quranic d dilemma, the Islamic dilemma. Uh, there are many dilemmas. Islam is a hot mess, but um, just learning a little bit about that, um, about the problems with Islam, uh, can can give us a lot of confidence. And I think just knowing you know one or two really solid um, arguments that are that are kind of quick and easy. Uh, should be something that absolutely everybody has in their mind, even if you are convinced you'll never meet a Muslim, because at some point you may. And and just with one of these arguments, we can, you know, as Greg Kokel says, put a stone in their shoe, give them something to think about that's going to bother them until they look into it. Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Um, what are some of the uh, cultural differences that Christians may need to know about as they interact with Muslims? I know you know, Islam is not a monolithic religion and every Muslim is different. But uh, what are some of those cultural differences between Christianity and Islam? Is that is that question clear? Yeah, Okay. I'm just thinking, I'm, I have all kinds of funny things coming up. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm picturing Muslim women screaming through my house, jumping on the couch to try to get away from the dog, keep the dog outside. <laughs> Um, not, not a fan of dogs. <laughs> if they're, if, you know, if they've been born and raised in the U.S., that may be different. But, uh, but certainly, you know, if they've just arrived from Afghanistan two weeks ago, put the dog in the backyard. <laughs> Unless you don't want visitors. Unless you don't want visitors. <laughs> they, they consider the dog to be unclean. Yes, right? yes. Okay. Unclean, terrifying. Um, yeah, all sorts of problems. If the dog is black, that's even worse, uh, as my dog is. Um, this. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Another one would be the difference between men and women. Uh, there's all sorts of differences there. Uh, Laura's probably best to speak to some of that, but you know, usually the Muslims I encounter are in America there's usually, if I go to a mosque, for example, there's there's men around and there's yeah. not really an issue. And usually you can just talk with the men and sometimes women will be present and listen. Other times there'll be women on our, you know, with us that are present and they're talking to Muslims. But outside of that, you know, there was a time I remember I was in a bookstore and I was really excited because this was a long time ago. Uh, a mother and a uh, her child, they were there, I guess the, uh, the, the lady's daughter had an assignment in school. They had to get a Bible. They didn't have one. Yeah. They weren't thinking about looking into Christianity, but they had to do some assignment. And uh, the mother said she was looking for a Bible that is poetic or like the Quran. She wanted to find something that was beautiful in its language. And I, I kind of, you know, I'm thinking, well, the, the one version of the Bible that does have some measure of uh, what she's looking for is the King James Version. But at the same time, I'm, 
I'm sort of hesitant about this because I'm thinking, well, she doesn't speak great English to begin with. She's going to have a great deal of difficulty with the King James Bible. And so I'm sort of at a, you know, I'm like, I, I do want her to, I don't want to misdirect her. But anyways, the, but the, this situation was kind of awkward because I already knew she was uncomfortable interacting with me. You know, we're in a bookstore and she's got the, you know, she's got her head covered and everything. And, and I could tell she was a little, you know, a little reticent to, to actually interact with me. And I, I didn't really press too much for a conversation. I just kind of helped her find a Bible. Uh, I won't tell you how that all turned out, but I mean, uh, which version I recommended or anything. <laughs> but but point is that there was that difference that and I was aware of it. And I'm thinking, uh, you know, I, I wish I could think of a way to maybe get her into a discussion. Yeah. But I thought, well, one thing I thought is in God's providence, maybe this encounter that ends pleasantly, then she'll be more open maybe down the road in, in, in a public in, environment, you know, to have a little bit more of an extended conversation, you know, so. Yeah, with, with that said, um, in the church today, we tend to think about evangelism um, as a, as a one-time event. Um, who, who would like to speak to evangelism as a, as a process? And I think that's very important for us to, especially with Muslims, is to to think long term and and how and just to have a more complete picture of biblical evangelism. Yeah. I, I think it is a process as, as the, the Lord sees fit. Yeah. You might have just one time. You know, my rule is simply this: get to the cross as fast as possible. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I've seen too many Christians go all over the place and they never get to the cross. Mm-hmm. I see that with with uh, other groups besides Islam and you know zealous Christians trying to evangelize. So I, I think, you know, it's interesting Jesus uses the seed analogy because just interesting seeds grow at different times, you know. But the fact of the matter is, you know, God ordains the means of the end. It may take a long process. God may use a long process like that um, to, to save his people. So you just gotta, as the Lord leads, you know, be ready, be equipped, and be able to present uh, evangelism in a clear and cogent way. I, I do want to piggyback on something you said, where Muslims get a lot of their theology, yeah, from the Quran. Also, Muslims get a lot of their Christian theology from unstudied Christians that misrepresent their own doctrines. Yeah, that's good. So I always hear, you know, I've heard Muslims so many times saying, well, I talked to that priest, or I talked to pastor so-and-so, and they have the worst views they have the worst information that's completely erroneous, but then it's challenging to say, well, that Christian's wrong, and what I'm telling you, you know. So that's another reason why Christians have to be definitive and they have to be clear and cogent in their own faith. And I'll just um, add on to the, you know, the, the time question uh, with witnessing to, to Muslims. I think it's important also to keep in mind that we are not just asking them to change um, their belief about God, um, that their identity is entirely wrapped up in being a Muslim. Their their sense of value and worth and community and even their own um, uh, safety. Most in, in a lot of cases, every single aspect of their lives is wrapped up in being a Muslim. Everything that they do and think and say is seen through the lens of being a Muslim. So um, it's it's this is not just you know. Um, let me convince you that Jesus rose from the dead, um, you know, having paid the penalty for your sins, and then you know you, you're good, right? Can we pray the prayer now? That is that is um, oftentimes, uh, you know, we do we do share the truth with them, absolutely. But um, but a lot of times, even after they've come to an intellectual belief, they are weighing, they're counting the cost, which is something that Jesus told people to do: count the cost. And so we, we need not necessarily get discouraged just because they're not ready to just um, drop their whole identity and lives and, and you know, follow that second. All right, excellent, thank you. Um, Anthony, uh, would you address maybe some of the uh, uh, between the Bible and, and the Quran as, as far as, you know, the, the Bible gives us a, a kind of a big picture of what God's doing in His creation, but the Quran is not so much like that. 
No, I, so, so the Bible has an unfolding story. Uh, you know, it begins in creation in, in the garden. Adam and Eve were placed in a garden paradise. It ends in a garden paradise. That's, mm. And it, if you read the first several chapters of Genesis closely, you see that the language used there, especially in the Hebrew text, is language that's picked up later and used for the temple when God has Israel construct the temple. And so the idea is that God dwelt there. It was his dwelling place among men. And, and the, the, the great tragedy of man's sin is that we lost that communion. Right, so that's what has to be restored. And that's what is being pictured in the tabernacle system, this temple system, that God is reestablishing his, his presence among men. And there's this way that the presence of God can be there. That's why it's all connected with sacrifice. Because now man has sinned and God's presence <coughs> otherwise means God's wrath. So the, the ceremonial system is set up to picture how that relationship is, is restored. So this is all promissory in the Old Testament. It's, it's anticipatory. It's looking forward to something. And that's why when Jesus comes, he constantly uses words like fulfilled, right? Uh, this, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Muhammad couldn't say these things, you know, not with any credibility. Right. He couldn't say, you know, I, I killed this whole tribe, slaughtered 800 Jews at one time. The, the, this was to fulfill the, the promise of Isaiah, the good news of a <laughs> Arabian that would come and be a terror to uh, people. That's just not, you know. So you have creation, fall, and redemption. And redemption is, is unfolded in the Old Testament. It's, it's disclosed what God is going to do. And, and God builds on that. So from one chapter to the next, you learn more about God's plan. And then when Christ comes, it's fulfilled. And now we look forward to the consummation when Jesus, who has already secured these future realities, will then bring them all to pass. So he's already won deliverance from death for us. Presently, we are uh, have eternal life spiritually, but we will also experience that in, in our bodies. And so, I mean, that's, that's the way the Bible works. But in the Quran, one of the things, and I didn't mention this, but one thing that causes a great deal of difficulty for Muslims is the whole issue of abrogation. There are verses in the Quran that supposedly abrogate other verses. You know, this was stated at one time, and then later another revelation comes along, and they believe that Allah is abrogating what he had said earlier. Well, the problem is the Quran's not arranged chronologically. And so now you need to know the order in which these things were revealed, and that's not easy to decide. And not, I'm just scratching the surface here, but that's a huge issue. Like, how do you know? Uh, you know, what if I come along? And where does the book really tell you, though, by the way? The book's supposed to be exhaustively detailed, right? Where does the book tell you this surah comes before that surah? So a Muslim today would say, just to give one example, that you are not allowed to drink alcohol at all. They wouldn't just say that it's wrong to get drunk or be a drunkard, but you can't even have any alcohol. That's allegedly the last thing Allah would do, which abrogates the earlier permission to drink. Well, how do we know? I mean, why isn't it the case that it's the permission to drink that came later? The Quran doesn't tell us that it came earlier. That's all based on post-Quranic tradition. So big differences, and I, that's just one small example. I think uh, if I could mention just sure. one more um, to add to that, although there, there are so many, but the um, uh, I think one thing that I found important when talking to Muslims is to know that throughout the Bible, there is a lot of historical narrative. So a lot of um, what we find in the Bible, it's describing what happened. It's not necessarily um, God approving of everything that happened or commanding everything that happened. And so I, I think we kind of take that for granted. We know when we read, for example, about David's adultery, that we're not supposed to go and do likewise, right? But in the Quran, this is supposedly a book that is is uh, just you know a, a bunch of uh, commands directly from from Allah, and so um, in in understanding them, I think that that can be really important. Awesome, thank you. Uh, what about the uh, the differences between uh, Sunni Islam and the Shiites? Who who would feel comfortable answering? Uh, I'd say quickly, the vast majority of Muslims would identify as Sunni. So there are Shia Muslims out there. The last time I heard a figure on this, in like 80%, 20%. Um, I don't usually keep up with all the statistics, but the vast majority are, are Sunni. And that doesn't mean that Sunnis are monolithic. There's so many differences right. among Sunnis. That would take us all day. 
and there's differences among Shia Muslims too. But a lot of it has to do with certain historical events and who they thought should have succeeded Muhammad. But this, this sets a trajectory that ends up just the development because these groups become kind of, you know, opposed to each other. They're, they're going to develop differently. They're not going to, some of the influences in these movements are not going to be the same. And so this one will kind of follow this trajectory and this one, this one. And what ends up happening then is, you know, there, there ends up being some differences of belief, some differences of practice. Uh, and, you know, but, but one thing you can be sure of is they all profess belief in the Quran. They don't have the same set of hadiths, for example, right. the narrations that are supposedly traditions from Muhammad. They have different traditions. So that's a big difference. Could you uh, elaborate on what the Hadith literature is for some of our folks here tonight? So the Hadith are allegedly things that were handed down orally <coughs> by Muslims from Muhammad. Well, there, there's, there's traditions from people that don't go all the way back to Muhammad, uh, but they have a whole science where they think they can determine which Hadith really go back to Muhammad and which ones don't. And when you look at the whole thing, it looks like a mess too. I mean, it, it's, it's a, you said hot mess. I mean, it's, it's a hot mess everywhere. <laughs> Quran, Hadith, everything. But they do claim that they have this ability to trace back these traditions all the way to Muhammad. And it's often those traditions that, so I could deal with, I could talk about what I did earlier uh, when I talked about the Quran being unintelligible. Or I could just freely grant to Muslims the without let you know without pushing the fact that it's a problem that you have to bring in the hadith to explain it because I think the hadith are very damaging. So the hadith often say things that I think are just uh, I wouldn't want to own up to them. And so, uh, but one thing that does though, going back to the Sunni Shia thing, is you can't always take for granted that Shia would accept some of those traditions. And so, if you're used to dealing with Sunnis and you go to them and you're going to pull out one of your favorite hadith, they might be like, oh, we don't accept that. So you always know the Quran is accepted. So if sometimes I just focus on the Quran until I find out where the person's coming from. Right. <clears throat> Dr. Valcour, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? Or? Okay. All right. Um, He's just hungry. <laughs> I, I was going back to Laura. I didn't want you to feel left out. Uh, uh, Laura, why, why are so many American women Converting to Islam. Yeah, I've noticed that this is happening too. It's really disturbing. Um, it is. I, I have yet to see a case where it is the result of a woman studying the Quran, the Hadith, um, Islam, and then making an informed decision. What I'm um, seeing largely is that we are living in a culture where it is not cool to be a Christian. It is not cool to be um, uh, to be white. It's it's um, um, a lot of our um, uh, traditions are being questioned and um, attacked. And so, um, especially with this kind of critical theory and intersectionality, if you're familiar with that, you know, if you are. Um, if you're if you're like a white male Christian um, and and older, you know you are like the consummate oppressor. You are bad. And if you are um, you know a minority in any area, um, you know if if you're a female or if you're um, a, uh, a if you're a person of color or if you're a Muslim or um, if you are homosexual, if you're transgender, then you are the oppressed. And the more of those characteristics that you have, uh, the, the more of a voice you're given and the more you are celebrated and honored today in our, in our culture. And so young women don't want to be white. <laughs> they don't want to be Christian. They don't want to be associated with tradition, um, uh, American tradition and, um, and they don't want to be associated with Christianity. And so um, I think that that has a lot to do with it. People want to be in that oppressed. They are lifted up, celebrated, and their voices are, are magnified. That's, that's primarily what I've been seeing. Awesome. Thank you. 
Um, one more question, and then maybe we'll take two or three questions if you guys have some tonight. Um, go back to Dr. Uh, Dalcor. We don't talk a lot about the Trinity today in, in many of our churches. <clears throat> Why is it so important for Christians who want to interact with Muslims to understand and really be able to defend the Trinity? Without the Trinity, you don't have evangelism. You can't just give someone John 3.16 and not explain the God that you serve. The Trinity is, we're, we're dealing with the nature of God. And Jesus says, if you're going to worship the Father, worship him in spirit and truth. That's the only valid worship. Without the Trinity, you're not worshiping God in truth. You're worshiping something else. And as we discussed before, you know, traveling, I see this all the time, a lot of, there's a lot of missionaries and we need missionaries, but we need the right ones with the right message because a lot of missionaries are undefined in their presentation. They're not, they're saying the same thing that a, a Mormon missionary would say. They're saying the same thing that a Roman Catholic would be saying. We have to be defined in the God that we serve. And don't be ashamed of the doctrine of the Trinity and not, well, you know, I don't think that's, they can really understand. God the Father sent God the Son to live the perfect life for his people. He died on the cross. The Holy Spirit regenerates those who believe, regenerates in order that they would believe. Um, he was resurrected on the third day. Look, we're talking about the biblical data of the God that we serve. This stuff is simple dimple when you're dealing with sufficient theology on the nature of God. When you say Jesus is God, we have to explain in which way is he God? Is he the Father? Is he one of three gods? Is he one of a multitude of gods? What does that mean? We have to be prepared to explain the sufficient theology of the doctrine of the Trinity, or we don't have God, and you have no business evangelizing, because what are you gonna say? Are you just gonna give John 3.16, and that's it? Everybody gives John 3.16. All the non-Christian cults give John 3.16. That's not really a factual evangelism. And I will say this, when dealing with the central theology and the gospel, there is no gospel without the incarnation. Paul says, this is part of my gospel in mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.8. He was of the uh, spermatos, you know, it doesn't get more literal than that, of David. He says, according to my gospel. There is no gospel without God the Father sending God the Son. There is no gospel without presenting the deity of Christ in which if you don't, if you deny this, you will die in your sins. But you have to explain evangelism in, to in totality also, you have to include, because the apostles included it, the only recognized gospel is justification through faith alone. You can't sit up here and say, well, I believe in the Trinity, and as long as you believe in the Council of Nicaea, the theology of Nicaea, hey, you must be a Christian like me. No, 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 because if you deny the cross work of Christ, you don't have the Christ of the Bible, which Paul says became our righteousness. In Roman Catholicism, in the Orthodox Church, and other non-Christian sect, they do not believe that Christ became the righteousness. They don't believe it. It's you yourself that have to climb on the cross and help Christ. In Roman Catholicism, Jesus is a junior savior. He's an impotent savior because he just can't save alone. So when we're dealing with evangelism, we have to include the Trinity, the concept. We have to include the deity of Christ, the incarnation, the physical resurrection, the ascension. These are the essentials of Christianity in which we're taught in scripture to communicate. Amen. Oh, that's that's very good. good work. Uh, what about you guys? What, anybody? Danny, go ahead, brother. Uh, just a question on that. I know there are some differences. I'm not entirely sure what all of them are, but between, I don't know if you want to say the mainline Islam or the nation of Islam, what are kind of some differences there? I know there are some that are Yeah, so the. Just to make sure that our online audience hears the question, what are, what are some of the differences between mainline Islam and the nation of Islam? Yeah, so one is wrong and the other one is wrong. wrong. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, so it's, it, it's a, per, you know, one is just, you know, it's an air, I think we were talking earlier uh, and actually some Christians historically have taken the position you were mentioning where it, it's possible to say that Islam is just this other religion. It's also possible to think of Islam more like a cult of Christianity where somebody came along and perverted it. 
And that was, you know, if you look at some of the earliest writings from Christians, that's how it was treated. John of Damascus, for example, he referred to it sort of as a, as a aberrant, distorted, not, he wasn't minimizing the significance of the difference. He thought it was a damnable heresy, but he did think of it as a perversion of Christianity because it does incorporate Christ. It, you know, it has, it claims to be following the previous scriptures, that sort of thing. Um, so Islam is, is a departure from Christianity. Well, the nation of Islam is a departure from the departure, right? So in the nation of Islam, uh, they have all kinds of wacky beliefs. I, I actually used to watch Louis Farrakhan for entertainment purposes because he, you know, some of these guys, I actually, you know, I watch some people that are cult leaders and stuff. And I think, why are people even interested in listening to them? Farrakhan, I actually used to find entertaining. So Farrakhan, if you've ever read the story uh, in Ezekiel, where it talks about him having this vision of, uh, really it's, it's what's called uh, a vision of God on his throne. So when God wants to appear, he, there's this appearance of, of, of a throne and angels bearing it up and that sort of thing. And it's the Merkava, you know, his throne and so forth. And there's this odd description in Ezekiel and people have puzzled over it over the centuries, but it talks about Ezekiel seeing a wheel intersecting a wheel and there's eyes all around it. Well, Farrakhan said that it's really a UFO and what, what it's describing, the eyes all around it are people looking out the, the windows of the spaceship, right? <laughs> and, and he would say, and I still, I can hear his, I can hear his voice in my head. He, he'll say, it follows me everywhere I go. And uh, so Farrakhan was entertaining, but this is, his view is that uh, there are multiple gods, finite deities, and there was an evil god who created the white man it's, it's basically a racist cult version of Islam. Uh, what's interesting, though, is so original Islam, Muhammad's version, endorsed owning black slaves, whereas the perversion of Islam, the nation of Islam, makes it out to be like the black man's religion and Christianity is the white man's religion. So it's like this flip-flopping of, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of bizarre stuff in the nation of Islam on top of the bizarre stuff that Muhammad taught. And man, I can only imagine if if people like Farrakhan knew what Muhammad actually taught about certain things, what he might have done with that. But I think they just kind of came along and just made up what they wanted to make up. So it's really just, you know, it's it's just a way of mask, or, you know, uh, baptizing racism in a sense. That's how that's how, you know. And I used to be around a lot of people that advocated the nation. In fact, one time, real quick story here, I heard that Sun Myung Moon. He is the founder of the Unification Church, was coming to speak. I used to live in Las Vegas. He was coming to speak in inner city churches. He was claiming to have the solution to the inner city problem. He was going to speak at a Methodist church in Las Vegas. And I go there because I'm going to confront him. He's teaching a false gospel and just bizarre stuff. And I, I got kicked out of there by security. Guess who was doing security? The Nation of Islam. <laughs> so here it is, a Methodist church, Sun Myung Moon is teaching, and the Nation of Islam kicked me out because uh, I was causing a ruckus. But anyways, the, uh, they're, they're bizarre. They got some really weird beliefs. But uh, there's an evil scientist god, black god, who created the white man. And so you're all products of the evil black god that uh, wanted to cause trouble. That sounds like something I Yeah, it was a cartoon. Or, uh, all right, well, we've got time for just about two more questions. Jody, did you have one? Yeah, I was talking about videos, guys talking about there was three passages in Isaiah 53 and Isaiah 53 that were talking about the three passages in the front where it says, in the Arabic language, where Jesus did not die. Oh yeah, so there are numerous passages. The issue has to, oh, so the question was, uh, are, are, there are, are there passages in the Quran where it says Jesus did die, I think is what you mean. No, did not, or yeah, did, did, did die. die. Yeah. yeah, I didn't catch you when you first said it, but I think that, yeah. That, so there are passages, so what happens is, sometimes when it refers to death, it uses a euphemism. And so the question is, are these passages literal um and, and what's the expression george you know what i'm talking about 
Yeah, and, and what's the euphemism? How do, how do you word that? Um, it, cause you to die. Yeah, but what's the um, cause you to, is it sleep or what, what is the, you know, saying, what's the other way of saying it? Would, you're trying to say that like martyrs, like people, it's don't consider them as dead because of their presence was gone. No, but there, there's an, this, this expression sometimes means cause to die. But can it mean like take, like to take, um, I, I can't remember the exact euphemism that this Rav, Rav Kappa, the, it usually comes with the word Rav Kappa before it, it means to take it myself, but in the English translation, yes. they skip completely translating the word into Otika. They just take it out of the translation. They put, I take it myself. Yeah, so so sometimes Muslims will render it like, I'll take you, and, and so people will take that differently in different ways. But it's often used to refer to death. And there's, there's huge problems that result if you don't think that Jesus died, even from a Quranic perspective. So, for example, Jesus in the Quran is uh, said to say um, uh, that he's going to pay zakat until the day that he dies. Right. So this is one of the things he's going to do to be faithful to Allah. Pay zakat. That's the poor do. Right. So if Jesus never died, he's still paying zakat, apparently, up in heaven. <laughs> uh that's a problem. I mean, there's all these problems that result from it. But yeah, so there's that book I mentioned. I have to get the, I have it in my hotel room actually. I was going to bring it. But there's a book that talks about all these different views on what happened to Jesus. And it talks about those passages. All right. Uh, one more question before we close that. Anybody? I have a question. Yes. Who wrote that rhyme? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. <laughs> some, some of us, every Muslim I have met, share the gospel. They say, uh, your Bible is written by man. Oh, okay. So, I need to know this answer. Who wrote the Quran? Yeah, so, Muslims can be, they can differ here, but for the most part, they don't <laughs> deny that it was written down by people. The, the main question is whether Muhammad was instrumental in the finalization of the Quran, its organization, or whether it was men later compiling everything they thought they got from him. So when Muhammad was getting his revelations, it, the way it would happen was he would, you know, his eyes would roll back in his head, he'd fall on the ground, he'd flop around like a fish, he'd moan like a camel, froth at the mouth, hear ringing in his ears, the buzzing of bees, all this kind of stuff that looks like Mark five, right? Legion and all that. Well, and, people, and everything that you're saying is coming from their oh, that, sources. Yeah, their right? sources. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't even think to come up with this stuff. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's wild. But, uh, so when Muhammad would then come out of these states, he would say stuff and people would write it down on whatever was available. Cause they didn't know when this was going to happen any more than he did. And they would write it on palm leaves, on, uh, bones, rocks, you know, whatever they could write on. And eventually when Muhammad died, they started trying to compile all this together. Uh, but some Muslims want to say Muhammad was present for this, but the, the best evidence doesn't point to it being compiled at Muhammad's time. Though they would claim that whatever was compiled came from his time. So, yeah, and there's, there's all kinds of debates in the traditional sources. So like, for example, Give you one example. The, the criteria was supposedly you needed to have two oral witnesses, people that had memorized it orally to a verse, and you had to have two textual witnesses before it could be included in the codex. But there were verses that didn't meet that criteria, and they still wanted them included. So as an example, this is another example of the sort of thing that I was doing earlier. If you look at Surah 9, 127 and 128, it says, to the believers, he is most kind, most merciful. Now, if you're a student of the Quran, you hear that language, you're thinking it's talking about Allah. Everywhere else it says that, it's talking about Allah. He's most kind, most merciful. As soon as you get to Surah 9, 127 and 128 though, all of a sudden it's talking about Muhammad. That's, I got an article on that too on answeringislam.org. There are Muslims who will tell you, like Rashad Khalifa, he wrote his own translation of the Quran called the Final Testament. He says those final two verses don't belong in the Quran, that they actually constitute attributes to Muhammad names that belong to Allah. 
So in his own translation, he says, these verses don't belong there. And he points out they didn't have the standard witnesses that were required for other verses. There were not two oral and two written witnesses to this. And so he claims the Quran is not perfect uh, as far as that. If he wants to say it's perfect, why don't you take those out? You know, but what else should be taken out? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you folks uh, so much for coming out tonight and uh, being a part of this conference. We'll begin tomorrow at 930. Is that great? Yes. Okay. George has kind of been working behind the scenes a little bit tonight. I'm going to ask him to uh, close this out in sure. prayer, if you would. Sure. Uh, just before we close, I want to uh, point to the table there if you want any resources. Uh, it's a great book about sharing the gospel with Muslims. And also we have a book by uh, Samuel Green. He would be with us, Lord willing, in September in our Strong Tower Conference in California. It's a great book also in witnessing to Muslims. Both books are available on the table if you want to look at them. Uh, please come and speak to us. Also, we would love our ultimate goal from this conference is to share the gospel with Muslims. Yeah. We love the Muslim people, we want to see them saved and coming to know Christ as our Lord and Savior. Our problem is not with the Muslims, it's with the teaching of Islam. And we want to see Muslims coming to Christ, that's why we are here. Amen? Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this uh, great brothers and sisters here, Lord Jesus, for all uh, uh, that they are willing to come and share the gift that you're giving them, Lord Jesus. I pray that you may continue to use them, Lord Jesus. But I thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters that came also to learn and how to share the gospel with Muslims, Lord Jesus. And I just pray, Lord, that you help us, Lord, to uh, take advantage of every opportunity to share the gospel with these people whom you love so much, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that they may come to know you, Lord, as the Lord and Savior of their life, Lord Jesus. We just thank you for this church, Lord, for opening their doors for us. I pray that you bless them mightily, Lord. And Lord, for tonight, I pray a uh, great rest for all of us, Lord. And, and for those watching online as well, Lord, I just pray that they may join us tomorrow. And uh, I pray Lord, that the many people that join today, Lord, that they will be able to use this information as well, Lord, wherever they are, Lord. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good job, guys. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. So tomorrow, I'm just gonna bring all my stuff since I'm leaving with you, right?